Are you an INFP or an ESTJ? What about your Minnesota multiphasic results? Or how did you do on your Rorschach test? The Big Five? There are dozens of personality tests and assessments with varying degrees of utility. Which tests are backed by science, and which tests are more entertaining than helpful? Let's find out. Dr. Jabal, MedSchoolInsiders.com For those of you who are new here, I earned my MD a few years ago, matched into plastic surgery, and ultimately resigned. But that's a story told on my vlog channel. Welcome to the next installment of our Research Explained series. If you like these videos, we have an entire playlist that is continuously being updated. So far, we've covered the scientific research behind wealth and happiness, studying with music, the importance of college prestige, and whether sunscreen is helpful or harmful. We'll continue to add to the series, so make sure that you are subscribed. Link in the description below. While personality assessments and tests have blown up in the past century, they originated for a simple purpose to help with personnel selection in the armed forces. More specifically, the developers of these tests hope that by studying personality and potential mental health issues, one would better be able to determine which soldiers were better or worse suited to fly military aircraft. Since then, dozens of personality assessments have emerged, each with a different theory on personality and how to best describe it. Our understanding of personality and models to describe and approximate it are purely a human invention, not concrete sciences. Each system has its own language and ideology, theories and philosophies in determining which traits are determinative and how to go about assessing them. How should we categorize traits? Are they binary or plotted along a bell curve? While seemingly based in science, few have truly followed any resemblance of the scientific method. In fact, most assessments were built on the creator's subjective feelings about personality rather than rigorous scientific protocols. For that reason, most personality tests tell us less about the individuals who take them and more about the individuals who devised them. For example, Hermann Rorschach was the Swiss psychiatrist who turned a parlor game into the iconic inkblock test. Stark Hathaway was a Midwestern psychologist who found it important to ask questions about religious beliefs, sex life, and bathroom habits in his Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or MMPI for short. If you've gotten to your psych rotation in medical school, you've likely heard of the MMPI too. And of course, there's Isabel Myers and Catherine Briggs, the mother-daughter housewife duo who studied Carl Jung's text and were inspired to create a personality test despite having zero background, training, or credentials in anything psych-related. Myers and Briggs are credited for creating the all-too-famous Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, or MBTI for short. According to CPP, the publisher of MBTI, it measures four pairs of opposing preferences, which are inborn and value-neutral, to form a person's four-letter type. The assessment discerns between extroversion or introversion, sensing or intuition, thinking or feeling, and judging or perceiving resulting in 16 different personality types, like ENFP or ISTJ. A few decades after the birth of the MBTI, a group of scientists began developing what would become the Big Five Personality Traits, or the Five Factor Model. Rather than relying on their intuition to select criteria for their test, they compiled every word that could be considered a personality trait and created simple questions about them. For example, on a scale of 1 to 5, would you say that you get upset easily? Do you follow a schedule? Based on these answers, the statisticians grouped traits that seemed to cluster together, such as being talkative and sociable, into five basic categories. Extroversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, and openness to experience. Chances are that you've heard of Myers-Briggs, but maybe you weren't aware of the Big Five, or its more recent derivative, the Hexaco test. Now why is that? Some suggest it's because of the thousands of people who have invested time and money in becoming MBTI certified trainers and coaches. Others say it's because the test focuses only on the positive, and therefore it seduces test takers with an image of their own ideal self. I argue that the biggest reason for its success is the neatly organized and binary manner of the test. There are four categories, each with a binary option. It's easy to comprehend, easy to explain, and you're able to readily identify with one of 16 tribes. And as humans, we love our tribes. Other personality tests, on the other hand, are not binary and are more of a continuum, which is less interesting, less easily understood, and less sexy. But unfortunately for the Myers-Briggs type indicator, 
People and their personalities are not binary, but are much more on a continuum. You're not a pure introvert or a pure extrovert, but usually somewhere in the middle. The insights of the MBTI are comparable to tarot cards or palm reading. Being generic enough such that when you read your description, you can certainly identify with parts of it, but it's not a truly accurate and comprehensive depiction of who you really are. When scientists look at such personality tests and assessments, two primary elements come to mind. Validity and reliability. Validity is a measure of how well a test measures what it claims to measure. Within validity, there are different types, such as content validity, criterion-related validity, construct validity, and face validity. Reliability is a measure of whether the test reliably indicates accurate results, meaning you would get the same result if you took the test more than once. Unfortunately for the MBTI, it receives piss-poor scores on both fronts. In one study, researchers found that 50% of people received different results the second time they took the test, even just 5 weeks later. Other studies have found similar results, ranging from 24 to 61% of people receiving different results when taking the test multiple times. The MBTI misses the mark in a few other ways, including one key element of personality, emotional stability versus reactivity, meaning the tendency to stay calm and collected under stress or pressure. This is one of the most important predictors of individual and group patterns of thought, feeling, and action. The judging perceiving scale reflects whether the test taker is more of a planner or the spontaneous type, but it overlooks the industriousness and achievement drive that accompany these characteristics. Together, they form a personality trait called conscientiousness. Lastly, in the binary system of the MBTI, traits are mutually exclusive. For example, under this model, thinking and feeling are on opposite ends of a single spectrum, meaning that if you are drawn to ideas and data, you cannot also have a preference for people and emotions. But research has demonstrated the exact opposite, that people with stronger thinking and reasoning skills usually also demonstrate emotional intelligence, being able to recognize, understand, and manage emotions. While it's a sad story for MBTI, there's good news for the Big Five. The test was shaped by an empirical process, and while not perfect, most studies since have demonstrated more acceptable levels of validity and reproducibility. So far, studies have demonstrated considerable power in predicting job performance and team effectiveness. Some researchers have even mapped the Big Five to relevant brain regions. And while the Big Five model is far from perfect, there's growing support for a hexaco model of personality, which is essentially the Big Five with a sixth trait, honesty, humility. Despite the Big Five being far superior than Myers-Briggs from a scientific validity and reproducibility standpoint, I don't think it's going to catch on, at least for lay people. It's just more catchy and easier to say that you're an INTP than saying you're 56% on openness and 35% on neuroticism. People sometimes expect personality tests to tell them some hidden secrets to their character. But the truth is, a personality test can only tell you what you tell it. Accuracy with the test is entirely based on how honest and self-reflective you are with your answers. If I told the test that I'm super patient and one to readily forgive, it would sure make me feel good, but I would just be lying to myself. But I'd argue there's still utility to personality tests, even if they're all far from perfect. And sure, entertainment should be one of the top reasons. I mean, let's be real. Including your Myers-Briggs on your online dating profile makes for a good conversation starter. The real utility is that it facilitates the process of introspection and reflection. Taking a personality assessment helps someone consider some of their strengths and weaknesses, and can often be a first step in having some important but difficult conversations. The most insightful realizations I've had in my own behavior, in my own ways of possible growth, wasn't from seeing the results of a personality test, but from speaking with close friends and families about areas of improvement. A personality assessment is by no means a prerequisite, but it can definitely help you get started. For those who are newer to self-reflection, personality tests can help you consider possible blind spots. While Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies is far from a perfect model, it helps one consider what external and internal factors motivate them to behave in certain ways. I even made a video applying her model to student life, helping you determine how to understand your personality tendency and use a variety of strategies and hacks to force yourself into being a better student based on that tendency. Now, were the four tendencies a scientifically valid and reproducible model? The data is lacking, and I wouldn't put my money on it, but hundreds of comments from students like you who successfully implemented and improved their performance is good enough for me. 
Other critics are quick to say that your personality is fixed and resistance is futile. It's a waste of effort. Why even try to change or improve yourself? Speaking from personal experience, I'd say you have far greater power over your own personality than you would expect. It's just that most people fail to make any significant changes because they don't put in the proper effort in changing their systems. In fact, a recent meta-analysis demonstrated that approximately 40% of a person's personality is due to genetic influence, while 60% can be attributed to environmental effects. If you enjoyed this video, you'll love my weekly newsletter. It gets sent out once a week and is super short. In it, I share weekly insights, tools, tips, and resources only available if you sign up via email. I don't publish it anywhere else. When new projects come up, small in-person meetups, special deals, or anything else that is very limited, I share it first with Med School Insiders newsletter subscribers. Check it out at medschoolinsiders.com forward slash newsletter. If you ever change your mind, it's one click to unsubscribe, and I promise I will never spam you. Thank you all so much for watching. Do you have any guesses as to what my Myers-Briggs type is? Let me know your guess down below, and I would love to hear yours as well. If you like this video, let me know with a thumbs up. I'm in the comments during the first hour after a new video uploads, so make sure you're subscribed with the notification bell enabled. Much love to you all, 